Welcome to this first information session for the Health Science uh, Program. This program is a very large program here at QCC, and together with faculty from the biology department, we have uh, made some substantial changes to the program, and it, they just went into effect recently, and so we wanted to host this session so that you are able to see uh, what options are here for you. Uh, also because the program is so large, uh, over a thousand students registered uh, this year. So we wanted to offer uh, this opportunity for you to see what is uh, here for you. All right. Throughout the presentation, you see this, uh, these codes. These will link you directly to the web pages within um, our, the QCC website that explain certain information. We can also, this is being recorded, so we can also share this uh, recording of the session for all those students that would like to see it again or those students that were not able to be present today. Uh, and we will also be happy to share the PowerPoint presentation if you want to, to have access to it. All right, so our health science program it's a pre-professional, it's an AS degree here at QCC in the health sciences. So it's going to give you uh, essentially, obviously, the first two years that can then be a, a bouncing board for a, a further career in the health sciences. Now, if you are here, uh, you may already be a health science major. Um, and if that is the case, I wanted to, we wanted to share what are some of the uh, requirements now? I mentioned a, a little bit ago that we made some changes to the program. So for the Common Core, you still have to fulfill uh, each of the buckets, but to... To point to some changes, or to highlight some changes, now a health science major is required to take Biology 301, which is Anatomy and Physiology 1. And within the individual and society bucket, you are now required to take Philosophy 140, which is Medical Ethics. And within the scientific world, you're required to take Psych 101, uh, which is the first psychology. And for the uh, last bucket, you would have to take anatomy too. So now in the health sciences, you have to take 301 and 302 to be able to graduate. We are going to uh, do the presentation first uh, with our colleagues here, and then we will have a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions as we progress, just hold your questions and we will try to address them uh, before the, the presentation is over. In addition to the Common Core, you, are, you have two major requirements now. You have to take Bio 150, which is Organization uh, and Delivery of Healthcare, and then you have to take Math 336, which is Statistics. Um, now, having uh, taken these uh, basic requirements for the AS uh, in Health Sciences, you then will have a choice of different concentrations. You can go with just the general health sciences. This would be for students that are unsure what to pursue next. Um, for students that may be inclined to pursue uh, or apply to the nursing program here at QCC, they would likely be uh, within that general health science uh, concentration. But if you have um, a, a better idea or you have more specific goals, then we have these additional concentrations. We now offer uh, a concentration in health services administration, occupational therapy, respiratory care, and medical imaging. So what we want to do today is discuss each of these concentrations. We'll talk about um, some of the career options, some of the salaries, and the wages for each of these, and then what are some of the requirements for each of these concentrations. So we'll work backwards. So I will begin discussing medical imaging and respiratory care, and then I will um, lead the way for, for the other faculty members to present. All right, so in medical imaging, um, students or uh, professionals in medical imaging will, uh, it's again, it's a very diverse uh, career. 
you can work with different diagnostic uh, techniques, different imaging techniques, uh, sound or, um, or x-ray, and um, or you can also, and, and again, it's usually mostly for diagnoses, but not just diagnostic tools. The, um, we can also use, uh, for example, nuclear medicine technologies, uh, technologies work in uh, tr uh, therapy and treatments. Um, so two very lucrative options are radiology and sonography. And here we have some data from the US uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics. This data is from 2022, so just this past year. It gives us an average salary for uh, nuclear medicine technologists in the range of about 85,000. So this, is, this would be salaries, again, it's average, uh, for individuals that are graduating with a bachelor. So it's not just the AS. The idea is that once you complete the AS here at QCC, you will then transfer into a senior college and you will obtain a bachelor's in um, medical imaging uh, or any of these sorts. So we will discuss some of the articulations and then transfer options that we have in the process uh, that are either already active or those that are being developed right now. Diagnostic medical sonographers also within the, the range of uh, $80,000. So it's obviously very lucrative and um, these are careers that have a lot of um, demand right now. Now, if you think you're inclined to pursue a career in medical imaging, if you want to do the medical imaging concentration here at with the health science program, in addition to the common core, in addition to the major requirements, which were statistics and bio 150, you would have to complete 20 credits from this bucket. Right? So you can decide how you get those 20 credits. You may take classes like um, introduction to public health, or you can take a year of chemistry, or you can take CPR, math, you can take physics, speech, right? So there's, it's a wide diversity of courses, and as long as you take enough courses to add up to 20 credits, again, that will satisfy the requirements for medical imaging. We do have already uh, a few existing articulations. So we have uh, an articulation, by the way, it's um, an agreement between a junior college like UCC and a senior college like SUNY Downstate, Molloy, or St. John's University. So it's an agreement, it's almost like a contract. Um, they would agree to uh, accept you if you qualify, if you meet all, all their uh, prerequisites. And um, and you have graduated from QCC with a health science degree in medical imaging, so they will take that credit, and um, then you can get accepted into their program. So we have um, an articulation with SUNY Downstate, so that if you are if you finish with medical imaging here at QCC, you can then transfer into their BS in diagnostic medical imaging. We have one with Molloy, and that one is in nuclear medicine. And then we have one with St. John's University, which is in radiologic uh, sciences. So these are already existing articulations. If you know that this is what you want to do, medical imaging, then you work backwards, right? You, you figure out what, which uh, school you see yourself, and then we look at, um, you know, you follow essentially all of their requirements that way. Now, an alternative concentration is respiratory care. A respiratory therapist is someone that works uh, with patients, alongside uh, physicians, obviously nurses, and um, uh, most often in a hospital setting. Um, you are dealing with patients that are having a difficulty with breathing and or delivery uh, of medicine for their lung function. You may be working, for example, with premature babies, or you may be working with someone that's very ill that has to be connected to um, a ventilators, right? So these, um, as a result of the pandemic and all of the complications that have been associated with COVID 
and um, a lot of the breathing disorders that have resulted uh, um, since then, the demand for respiratory therapists has exploded. So um, we were looking at, yesterday I was looking at some of the, the numbers from the US um, uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics, and it was something to the effect of 120,000 positions available open now across the nation for respiratory therapists. Um, as you see, uh, and these numbers have increased at least $10,000 from, tw from 2021. So the demand is really high, and that is reflected in the salary uh, average. So graduating with a bachelor's in respiratory uh, care, as a respiratory therapist, you can begin with a salary of about $90,000. And here in New York, it's probably higher than that. We have uh, spoken with uh, people from senior colleges, and they say it's more like $100,000 to start. And the hospitals are so desperate for these, um, for, for these professionals that they are hiring the students even before they complete their graduation. So the moment you graduate, it's almost uh, a sure thing that you'll have a position waiting for you. So this is a very, very lucrative uh, career option for you. And obviously, it would be very fulfilling, and you're going to be dealing with, with patients that are or can be very, very sick. And so your, this work is extremely important. Now, if you decide that this is what something that you would like to pursue, and again, um, in addition to the common re core requirements and the major requirements, you also have to fulfill 20 credits from this bucket. Right? So as you see, these are more um, heavy science options. So you'll have to take, or you can also take a year of, bi of general biology, microbiology, chemistry, physics, or math. Now, we do have an existing articulation with Molo University. And right now, we are developing two more articulations, one with Stony Brook and one with LIU Brooklyn. Um, we will discuss the private first. So, so obviously, there is, and again, these agreements are already either already working in, in action now or being developed so that if you take all of those requirements and you fulfill those prerequisites, then you can transfer directly from QCC into these uh, senior colleges, into these programs, and graduate usually within the next two years. So it's, it, it can be very efficient. Um, and again, it, the, the demand for this, for this careers are very high. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the third concentration in our list of concentrations. This is occupational therapy. And um, occupational therapy is a rehabilitative uh, area where you're helping, to, um, helping people to regain their use of their arms or, or feet or whatever it is that um, it, it, they're having problems with. Usually people have either had an illness uh, or some kind of injury that would lead them to require occupational therapy. And it's very much um, living skills that occupational therapists are involved with. They're, you know, you have day-to-day -day living requirements. You have to dress, you have to get up in the morning, you have to eat, you make your food, you have to get to work, you have to drive. All these different kinds of skills are the kinds of things that occupational therapists focus on to help be people be able to regain the normal activities of life. It is an area that requires a master's degree. So it's beyond the bachelor's, and we'll talk a minute, in a minute about a, a, one, of the, um, articul one of the colleges that we have made an articulation with, where you can go from here straight into a program for OT where you get your, your bachelor's there and your master's. So that is something that's possible. Alternatively, you can stay uh, at Queensboro, get your AS, go to a college, a four-year college, and get your bachelor's, and then apply to um, a occupational therapy program. 
The uh, salaries, again, are quite high. They're up in the range of uh, the, the mid to 90s, 90,000. There's uh, a lot of different places where you can work as an occupational therapist. You can be working in a hospital, in a clinic. You could be working in a school. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there are a lot of opportunities. And people can even open their own offices and have their own businesses being an occupational therapist. The um, requirements that you would take would somewhat depend on, I mean, this is the list that what we would consider our bucket. You need 20 credits from the list that you see up here. Eight credits need to come from the first batch and another six from the uh, lower uh, part of the screen. Um, depending on which school you're applying to, as uh, Dr. Carmona said, you have to work backwards sometimes, which which things should you choose to take? Well, depending on which um, occupational therapy school you want to go to, you would see what their requirements are and make sure that you meet the requirements of that school. In generally, what uh, many of the occupational therapy schools have in common is they want 12 credits of laboratory science beyond the anatomy and physiology that you would be taking. So you would take an additional 12 credits, whether it be general bio or physics or chemistry. I th sometimes there's flexibility. They don't require necessarily which ones you take. That's pretty common in several of the OT schools that we've looked at. But they also all want a certain level of the social sciences where you would be looking at psychology and sociology. So those are also uh, courses that you would need to be taking. Currently, we have an existing articulation with Turo University. If you are accepted into their program, if you meet all their prerequisites, you would graduate from here with your AS degree and transfer into their institution where you would take the courses that would give you both your bachelor's degree and your master's degree. And it would be done in three years. So in three years, you would get your bachelor's and your master's. There's a high demand for occupational therapy. People are getting jobs very easily out of, um, out of their, uh, when they graduate from their programs. We um, have another articulation. There are other schools, obviously. This is the school that we have an articulation with. We, there are other schools, obviously, for OT that you can look into, or, or you can speak to a faculty member to help you look into other options. But um, a, lot of the OT, a lot of the OT programs want you to get a bachelor's first before you apply to them. Here, you would be able to do it directly from Queensboro. Uh, we are also developing, this is not OT, this is physical therapy. We are also in the process de of developing a physical therapy um, articulation with Downstate Medical Center. Um, that is actually a PhD program. You would, it similarly like, for the OT that I said, you would get your associate's degree here. Then you would have to get 20 credits beyond that. So you could do that mostly here or in a four-year college. And then you can apply, and they would accept your prereq prerequisites um, from Queensboro. And you would go into um, a doctorate in physical therapy. Um, so we're in the process of developing that. Um, the, we have a professional partner that we're just starting to work with. It's called Spear Physical and Occupational Therapy. They have many different um, clinics around the New York City area. Some are not that far from Queensboro. And they are uh, speaking to us about opportunities for internships and employment, and the employment that they have, if you, if you are really interested in the area of occupational therapy or physical therapy, you should, um, you know, once uh, we develop this a little further with SPEAR, we'll send out information to students, but they are looking to hire. They look to hire students who are not graduated yet, but who want to assist in OT and PT, plus we'll be developing internships with them as well. Just a quick um, comparison of what PT is versus OT. 
First of all, the requirement is a little different, so you need a doctorate for physical therapy and a master's in OT. Um, physical therapy very often is trying to um, get you to restore your physical strength and your motor skills. It usually, um, it's going to be exercise-based. The rehabilitation is very involved with exercising the muscles or using treatments on the muscles to help the muscles become stronger. Um, so it's going to help a person uh, re regain their use of their arms or their legs that they might not be able to use because it's either in pain or it's been injured. It helps them increase their range of motion, their strength, and um, the, a lot of exercise involved with physical therapy. In occupational therapy, as I mentioned before, which is a master's program, it's more day-to-day -day living skills, being able to cope within your normal environment, both your home environment and your work environment. So it's going to work with you on daily activities so that you can manipulate things that you need to manipulate if you need to uh, learn how, you know, relearn how to handle a stove and turn it on. Those are the kinds of activities they'll do with you or how to drive a car or how to work on your computer so you can go back to work. Another one of our concentrations is now in a very, very different vein. It's health services administration. And health services administration is kind of a marriage between healthcare and business. So, you know, sometimes we have students that um, are really, really, really interested in going into a health profession. And then they take anatomy and physiology and they don't do well and they're all upset and they drop out and maybe they leave the college and they never come back or, or they just go into something else. So if any of you feel like I'm talking about you um, or if you know people that this might apply to, you could pass this information on to them. There are other areas where you could work in healthcare. You could work in a hospital, in a clinic, but they will be more on the management end of things, more in the business end of things. And the salaries are actually pretty incredible. If you look at the starting salary for uh, medical and health service managers, usually it's a little bit over 100000 So there's really, really excellent career opportunities for those who want to do health, but science isn't their thing. So. Here's the kind of courses you would be taking if you took health services administration. You'd need to take 20 credits. And if you look at the kind of courses, it's public health, um, accounting, business law, business organization and management, you know, macroeconomics, microeconomics, sociology. You know, there's a whole range of things, and you didn't notice one hard science in that listing. So keep that in mind, pass that information on to your friends who dropped out of A&P, let them know that there are other opportunities for them. Right now we have an existing articulation with St. John's University in this area, and we are in discussions with two other colleges, two CUNY colleges also in this field. So we have this, um, as you notice, we're going backwards in the list of concentrations that were presented in the beginning. Uh, if you don't, if you're not interested in any of the four concentrations that we've been talking about, or you don't know what you want to do if and when you grow up, then you can, fall, you can follow the pathway in this general health sciences. So this is sort of the miscellaneous. It's like everything else but be the above four which is a nice thing if you don't know what you want to do, uh, but at the same time, you have to be a little careful because you don't want to spread out too thin and then be left with, you know, two years later, you still don't know what to do. So you still need a plan, but we're, still, we're giving you this option to try uh, something else or give you some time to figure out if you want to, spe you want to specialize into something along the way. So the general health sciences concentration is uh, a more broader spectrum. Uh, it's also the uh, concentration that you would sign up for 
if you wanna, if you are planning on following the nursing path, which I know a lot of you uh, are in that uh, category. So this is the category where you have the most options for courses. So again, this is in addition to the common core and the major electives that were shown uh, in the beginning. Uh, you see that general biology now is moved into this category because there are a lot of fields within the health sciences in the professional category that they require uh, general biology. Um, and again, there are different courses. Chemistry is under this uh, category. Uh, uh, again, it's uh, 20 credits from everything, but more specific number of credits within these subcategories. Uh, so there are three subcategories um, six credits from one, uh, three credits that have to do more with management and computers, so not heavy in, in the health, uh, in, uh, in the sciences, in the natural sciences, and then uh, one course essentially in psychology slash uh, sociology category. Uh, again, we have one articulation set in stone with uh, Molloy, University, in, and they call it interdisciplinary uh, studies, which is as broad as our uh, general category. And we're working on some other articulations with uh, mostly SUNYs and uh, one BS in public health with St. Francis College, which is a private school uh, in Brooklyn. We want to emphasize the importance of these articulations. We've been putting uh, when we say me, we, not only the science faculty, but the administration as well, in creating these articulations. And there are a lot of advantages of having these articulations, uh, but certain points that we want to bring your attention to. So as Dr. Cremona mentioned, it, it is sort of a contract, an agreement that we come, that Queensborough comes with, with the articulating uh, college. The nice thing about it is that if you apply to one of the senior colleges that we have an articulation with, they are much less picky in the courses that, we're, that you are transferring because they have already agreed to take your credits, okay? So they're gonna take the whole package. You are not going to lose credits. So if you graduate with your 60 credits for your AS degree, you, you get the whole package going in, okay? And it doesn't matter how you got to those credits. You saw in the previous slides that you have some flexibility. We give you a lot more courses to choose from. It doesn't matter which course you took. If we have an articulation, they have to accept your, your degree, right? And it's, and it's also an incentive for you to complete your associates. Because one of the things that we have been encountering the last few years is that students come to Queensborough you take a bunch of classes, but you don't fulfill the requirements for an associate's degree. And sometimes students are short by a handful of credits without their degree, and then it's a disadvantage because when you go to apply and you try to transfer, that they start looking, looking at your, your credits and you have a higher chance of missing out on things. So take advantage of the articulations and try to complete all the requirements for your associate's degree. The other advantage of completing the associates is that if something happens, if you have to take a pause in your studies, at least you have a degree in your hand and maybe you can find a job in the meantime, you know, before you continue to your bachelor's. So with the articulation, as I said, the, the, the articulating schools will accept the whole package and you don't have to worry too much about the details of the transferring. There's also fl some flexib flexibility in the requirements of the minimum GPA. So we, are, we have some articulations, for example, with SUNY Farmingdale that, yeah, they have a minimum, but that minimum GPA is a lot lower than other programs, all right? Which also, if, you're, if you know, something happens and your GPA is not that great, it doesn't mean that you're cut off. You know, take advantage of these, uh, these are articulations, all right? So they, some schools have lower minimum requirements than, than others, uh, and you can take advantage of it. And, you know, maybe you, you, you won't be able to get into the nursing program of your dreams, but it doesn't mean that you're cutting out the continuation of your studies in a path that can be fulfilling and can lead to a good job down the road. Another thing... Uh, about the articulation agreements is that 
Sometimes the articulating schools have financial options specifically. These are earmarked specifically for QCC transfer students. Okay? So which means that you're only competing until, uh, you know, with your classmates and you're not competing with a larger pool of applicants for financial aid and scholarships. Okay? Especially for scholarships because it's not a loan. You don't have to pay it back, which is a huge advantage. Okay? Um, I just want to make in a couple of other bullet points. Um, we're trying to create articulation agreements with both state schools, city schools, so CUNY, SUNYs, and private. And when you make your plans, it's nice to diversify. And I hate to sound like a financial person, uh, but it, you, know, you know, this concept applies here. Um, have a primary goal, if that's what you want, it's great. To, to have a primary goal and go into that uh, goal, but you know, have a backup. Uh, it's good to, yeah, if you want a private school which ha has the great name, it may lead to a greater salary down the road, but don't exclude other options, okay, as you, as you make your plans. Um, and this kind of gives you an idea of what, this, this, this uh, spreadsheet may seem a little overwhelming. It was overwhelming the first time that I saw it, but now I'm getting used to it. Um, this gives you an idea of what we mean with the general uh, health sciences uh, concentration. As you can see here, there's a whole bunch of schools that we've been talking to, and they have very different requirements and prerequisites uh, and GPA uh, minimum. Um, so you have to look at a table like this and think about what you want to do. And depending on whether you want to go to that private school or whether you want to go to a CUNY school, you have to choose your courses while you're here in a more smart way so that you don't miss out. The other thing that uh, is sort of a, um, a take home from this slide is that there's a lot of diversity in your options in this general health sciences category, all right? So the, the, the uh, notations are explained in the bottom here. So the X's are the courses that are recommended for admission, right? So if you're planning on going into one of these programs, you know, aim for those courses first. Um, the plus signs indicate list of possible electives. So it's sort of yeah, like your second category of courses. It's great if you take them, but if you don't take these courses, it doesn't mean that you're left out. And then the dashes are not recommended. So yeah, you can take those courses if you want to, but they're probably not gonna make a difference in your application down the line. All right, so that's how we've, we've grouped this. Uh, so this is something to study. This is something to think about by yourself and think about with your advisors and we're trying to give you different options in terms of programs and in terms of schools. So in summary, try to make a plan as soon as you can. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to draw out your plan for the next four or five years in stone from you know, the summer of your freshman, before your freshman year but it's good to have an idea about what you want to do and according to that, to plan your courses. Take advantage, you know, look at the, the common core requirements that you have to take in the beginning as well. You have to take them uh, in the beginning anyway, and that can buy you some time to think about what you want to do down the line. Um, and have a backup plan. I have, I've talked to students who come in and say, I want to get into the QCC nursing program. And that's where it ends. That's where the plan ends. Not a good idea. It's great to have aspirations. And I'm not saying that you can't, we're not saying that you can't do that. But things happen. And it's good to have a backup plan. Right? Have a primary goal, but also have a backup in terms of other schools, but also other career options. Okay? And that's what we're trying, we've been trying to do the last few years in terms of organizing. 
Think about yourself, talk to classmates, talk to people that you know in your family, your circle, your social circles. Maybe you know people who are in these fields to give you some feedback, but also talk to your advisors. Uh, so when you come in, you're probably going to the general advising office and try to pencil out your, your plans for the upcoming semester. Uh, but we're gonna give you a list of faculty members in the biology department uh, that can also guide you down the line, especially as you, maybe in your second year, start talking to us. Um, this is the list of faculty advisors that we have right now um, with their email, uh, our email addresses. Uh, so feel free to reach out. Maybe you know some of these people, you feel comfortable talking to somebody on this list you know, approaches and approach us early. It's good to talk to an advisor at least once before you register for an upcoming semester. Not only to plan your next semester, but plan two semesters ahead of time, three semesters ahead of time, so you can graduate on time. You know, finish your associates in two years uh, and you don't miss out on credits, you don't miss on time, uh, and you can progress, and again, we understand that you have a lot, of a lot of you have a lot of other things happening in your lives, but the closer you plan and the closer you follow that plan, the better off you'll, you'll be uh, into obtaining your goals. All right, so we're here to help you. We're here to help you plan, and we're here to help you to complete that plan and achieve your goals.